Section 11 of Movies and Hollywood Short Story Collection, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Samantha Gubitz. The Moving Picture Rights, Part 2 by Montague Glass. Harris Rudnick had been encouraged to misogyny by cross eyes and a pockmarked complexion. Nevertheless, he was neither so confirmed in his hatred of the sex, nor so discouraged by his physical deformities, as to neglect shaving himself and changing into a clean collar and a Sabbath blacks before he began his journey to the Bella Hirschkind home. Thus, when he alighted from the Mount Vernon car at Ammerman Avenue, he presented, at least from the rear, so spruce an appearance as to attract the notice of no less a person than Miss Bluma Duckman herself. Miss Duckman was returning from an errand on which she had been dispatched by the superintendent of the home, for of all the inmates she was not only the youngest, but the spryest, and although she was at least a half block behind Harris when she first caught sight of him, she had no difficulty in overtaking him before he reached the railroad track. "'Excuse me,' she said as he hesitated on the side of the track. "'Are you maybe looking for the Bella Hirschkind home?' Harris started and blushed, but at length his misogyny asserted itself, and he turned a beetling frown on Miss Duckman. "'What do you mean am I looking for the Bella Hirschkind home?' he said. "'Do you suppose I come up here all the way from Brooklyn Bridge to watch the trains go by?' "'I thought maybe you didn't know the way,' Miss Duckman suggested. "'You go along that there path, and it's the first house you're coming to.' She pointed to the path skirting the railroad track, and Harris began to perspire as he found himself surrendering to an impulse of politeness toward this very young old lady. He conquered it immediately, however, and cleared his throat raspingly. "'I couldn't swim exactly,' he retorted as he surveyed the miry trail indicated by Miss Duckman. "'So I guess I'll walk along the railroad. You could do that, too,' Miss Duckman said. "'Ah, but I ain't allowed to, on account of the rules of the home say we shouldn't walk along the tracks.' Harris raised his eyebrows. "'You don't mean to told me you are one of them indignant females,' he exclaimed. "'I belong in the home,' Miss Duckman replied, coloring slightly. And Rudnick felt himself being overcome by a wave of remorse for his bluntness. He therefore searched his mind for a sufficiently gruff rejoinder, and finding none, he shrugged his shoulders. "'Well,' he said at last, "'there's worse a places, lady.' Miss Duckman nodded. "'Maybe,' she murmured. And anyhow, I ain't so bad off as some of them other ladies up there, which they used to got husbands and homes of their own. Ain't you a widow too? Rudnick asked, his curiosity again getting the upper hand. I ain't never been married, Miss Duckman answered as she drew her shawl primly about her. Well, you ain't missed much, Rudnick declared, so far as I could see. Why, Miss Duckman exclaimed, ain't you never been married neither? Rudnick blinked solemnly before replying. <laughs> You're just like a whole lot of ladies, he said. You must got to find out everything. He turned away and stepped briskly on to the railroad track. But you ain't married, Miss Duckman insisted. No, he growled as he started off. Got to dunk. For a brief interval, Miss Duckman stood and watched his progress along the ties. And then she gathered her parcels more firmly in her arms and began to negotiate the quagmire that led to the home. She had not proceeded more than a hundred feet, however, when a locomotive whistle sounded in the distance. "'Hey, mister!' she shouted. But even if Rudnick heard the warning, it served only to hasten his footsteps. Consequently, the train was almost upon him before he became aware of it, and even as he leaped wildly to one side, the edge of the cowcatcher struck him a glancing blow. Miss Duckman dropped her bundles and plunged through the mud to where Rudnick lay, while the train, which was composed of empty freight cars, slid to a grinding stop a short distance up the track." She was kneeling recklessly in the mud, supporting Rudnick with both her hands, when the engineer and the fireman reached them. "'Is your husband hurt bad?' the engineer asked Miss Duckman. The tears were rolling down Miss Duckman's worn cheeks, and her lips trembled so that she could not reply. Nevertheless, at the word husband, her maidenly heart gave a tremendous bound, and when the engineer and the fireman lifted Rudnick gently into the caboose, her confusion was such that without protest she permitted the conductor to assist her carefully up the car steps. "'Sit ye down on that stool there, lady,' he said. "'As far as I can see, your man ain't got no bones broken.' "'But,' Miss Duckman protested. "'Now me, dear lady,' the conductor interrupted, "'don't you go worrying yourself.' 
I got me orders if anybody gets hit by the train to take him to the nearest company's doctor in the direction I'm going, see? And if you was Mr. and Mrs. Vanderbilt, they couldn't treat you no better up to the emergency hospital. But, Miss Duckman began. Again, she attempted to explain that Rudnick was not her husband. And again, the conductor forestalled her. And if he's able to go home tonight, he said finally, you'll be given free transportation in a parlor car, do you mind? Like you'd be on your honeymoon. He patted her gently on the shoulder as he turned to a waiting brakeman. Let her go, Bill, he cried. And with a jubilant toot from the engine, Miss Duckman's elopement was fairly underway. When Harris Rudnick opened his eyes in the little white curtained room of the emergency hospital, Miss Duckman sat beside his bed. She smiled encouragingly at him, but for more than five minutes, he made no effort to speak. Well, he said at length, what are you kicking about? It's an elegant place this here home. Miss Duckman laid her fingers on her lips. You shouldn't speak nothing, she whispered. On account of you are sick, Alba, not serious sick. I know I'm sick, Rudnick replied. I was just figuring it all out. I'm getting knocked down by a train and no bones is broken. Miss Duckman hastened to assure him. You would be out in a few days. I'm satisfied, he said faintly. You got a fine place here, missus. Miss Duckman laid her hand on Rudnick's pillow. I ain't a missus, she murmured. My name is Miss Bluma Duckman. Bluma, Rudnick muttered. I once used to got a sister by the name Bluma, and it ain't a bad name neither. He was not entirely softened by his mishap, however. But anyhow, that ain't here or there. He said, Woman is just the same, always kick it. What's the matter with this home, Miss Duckman? It's an elegant place already. This ain't the home, Miss Duckman replied. This is a hospital, which when you was hit by the engine, they put you on the train and took you up here. Abba, what are you doing here? He asked after a pause. I come along, Miss Duckman said, and now you shouldn't talk no more. What do you mean you come along? He cried. Didn't you go back to the home? Miss Duckman shook her head, and Rudnick turned on his pillow and looked inquiringly at her. "'How long am I up here, anyhow?' he demanded. Full days,' Miss Duckman said, and Rudnick closed his eyes again. For ten minutes longer he lay still, and then his lips moved. "'What do you say?' Miss Duckman asked. "'I says, Bluma is a pretty good name already,' he murmured, smiling faintly, and the next moment he sank into a light sleep." When he awoke, Miss Duckman still sat by the side of his bed, her fingers busy over the hem of a sheet, and he glanced nervously at the window through which the late afternoon sun came streaming. "'Ain't it pretty late you should be away from the home?' he inquired. "'It must be pretty near six, ain't it?' "'I know it,' Miss Duckman said, "'and the doctor says at six you should take this here powder.' "'Ah, but shouldn't you got to be getting ready to go back to the home?' he asked. Miss Duckman shook her head. "'I ain't going back no more,' she answered. I got enough of them people. Rudnick looked helplessly at her. But what will you do? He said. You ain't got no other place to go. Otherwise, you wouldn't got to live in a home. Sure, I know, she replied as she prepared to give him his powder. But got to dunk. I still got my health, and I'm telling the lady superintendent here how they work me at the home, and she says I could stop here till I'm finding something to do. I could cook already, and I sew already, and if the worst comes to the worst, I could find a job in an underwear factory. They don't pay much, but a woman like me, she don't eat much. All I want is I could get a place to sleep, and I bet you I can make out fine. So you should please take the powder. Rudnick swallowed his powder. You, uh, you says you could cook, he remarked after he had again settled himself on his pillow. Zimis, for instance, und flesh kugel? Zimis, und flesh kugel is nothing, she declared. I don't want to say nothing about myself, understand me because lots of women to hear em talk, you would think wonder what cooks they are. And they couldn't even boil a potato even. I if you could eat my gefelte Grindabus, Mr. Rudnick, he said as he licked his moist lips. Harris Rudnick. Mr. Rudnick, she proceeded, Ada, my tobacco, you would got to admit I ain't so helpless as I look. You don't look so helpless, Rudnick commented. I bet you you could do washing even. Could I? Miss Duckman exclaimed. Why, well, sometimes at home I'm washing from morning till night, Abba. I ain't caking none. It really agrees with me, Mr. Rudnick. Rudnick nodded. Again he closed his eyes, and had it not been that he swallowed convulsively at intervals, he would have appeared to be sleeping. Suddenly he raised himself on his pillow. Uh, do you maybe make a good cup of coffee also? He inquired. A good cup of coffee I make in two ways, Miss Duckman answered. The first is... Rudnick waved his hand feebly. I'll take your word for it, he said, and again lapsed into quietude. Do you know, he murmured at length, 
I ain't drunk a good cup of coffee in years already. Miss Duckman made no answer. Indeed, she dropped her sewing and passed noiselessly out of the room, and when she returned ten minutes later, she bore on a linen-covered tray a cup of steaming, fragrant coffee. How was that? Miss Duckman asked after he had emptied the cup. Rudnick wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. All I could say is, he replied, if you zimus ain't no wusser as your coffee, Miss Duckman, nobody could kick that you ain't a good cook. Miss Duckman's faded cheeks grew pink, and she smiled happily. I guess you are trying to make me a compliment, she said. In my whole life, I never made for a woman a compliment, Redneck declared. I never even so much as met one I could make a compliment to yet except you. And my to you, it ain't no compliment after all, it's the truth. He lay back on his pillow and gazed at the ceiling for a full quarter of an hour while Miss Duckman sewed away industriously. After all, he said at last, why not? Older men as me done it. Did you say something? Miss Duckman asked. Rudnick cleared his throat noisily. I says, he replied, you should please be so good and don't bother yourself about that now underwear factory job till I'm getting out of here. A home is a home, B. Lessengeld said as he and Bell sat in the office nearly a week later. But if Schindelberger wouldn't show up here with Rudnick today yet, Bells, we could foreclose sure. Would we? Bells retorted. Well, I got something to say about that too, Lessengeld, and I'm going to give the Bella Hirschkahn people a couple days longer. Today is Bloom of Duckman's day out again, and me and Mrs. Bells, we sit home last night, and we couldn't do a thing on account of Mrs. Bells' dreading it so. Think what it would be if that woman is thrown back in our hands. If she is so terrible as all that, why do you let her come at all? Lissengeld asked, and Bells heaved a great sigh. I tell you, Lissengeld, he said, she's really got a very good heart, you understand. Abba, is it Mrs. Bells' fault she ain't such a number one cook? Every time that Bloom and Duckman comes round, she rubs it in yet, and she snoops under the bed to see is it clean or not. And she gets the girl so woke up, understand me, that we are hiring a new one every week. At the same time, the woman means well, Lessengeld, but you know how that is. Some people mean so well, you couldn't stand them at all. Lessengeld nodded. Sure I know, he said. I seen it last week, a case where a fellow all the time means well and is trying to do good. He's taking pity on a tramp, understand me, and the tramp gives his silver spoons and everything. And I said to Mrs. Lessengeld, Mama, I says, it only goes to show, I says, if you feel you're beginning to take pity on a fellow, I says, you shouldn't got no mercy on him at all, I says. Otherwise, he'll go to work and do you every time, I says. So that's why I'm telling you, Bells. I guess the best thing we could do is we should right away foreclose Rudnick's house on him. Then, if Schendelberger is such a charitable suckle as all that, let him buy the in the house for the Bella Hirschkind home and be done with it. All we want is our money back. We should be satisfied. What's the use we consider Rudnick's feelings, ain't it? <laughs> do you think I'm holding off on Rudnick's account? Bells exclaimed indignantly. I never even got an idea to take pity on the fella at all. An old schnoozer like him, which he's got only one house to his name, understand me. He don't deserve no better. So go ahead, ring up Schindelberger and tell him that's what we would do. Lessengeld turned to the desk. But even as he took the telephone receiver from the hook, Schindelberger himself came in. Andlick, Bells exclaimed. We were suspecting you a whole week yet. Are you ready to fix up about Rudnick's mortgage? Schindelberger sat down and carefully placed his hat on Bell's desk. Mortgage, I uh, didn't come to see you about exactly, he said. I got something else to tell you. Something else I ain't interested in at all, Bells rejoined. We was just going to telephone and ask you why don't Rudnick fix it up about the mortgage. I'm coming to that presently, Schindelberger said. What I want to say now is, Mr. Bells, that I'm very sorry that I got to come here and tell you an information about your wife's cousin, Miss Bloom Duckman. Bloom Duckman, Bells exclaimed. What's the trouble? Is she sick? Schandelberger shook her head. Worser is that, he explained. She disappeared from the Bella Hirschkind home a week ago already, and nobody sees nothing from her since. For a brief interval, Bells stared at his visitor, and then he turned to Lessengeld. <laughs> Ain't that a fine note, he said. All we are discovering is a couple packages she got with her, which the superintendent sends her over to West Farm. She should buy some groceries, and on her way back, she drops the packages and disappears. Might she fell down a rock, maybe? Lessengeld suggested. The other day, I'm seeing a film where a fellow falls down a rock already, and they search for him a hundred people yet. They get near him, as I am to you, Schindelberger, and still they couldn't find him. Anyhow, on account, the fellow is too weak to say something. <laughs> How could she fall down a rock? Schindelberger inter interrupted. It's all swamps up there. But anyhow, Bells, 
We are wasting time here talking about it. The best thing is you should ring up the police. <laughs> what do you mean, wasting time? Bells cried. You're fine one to talk about wasting time. Here the woman disappears a week ago already, and you are only just telling me now? Schindelberger blush. Well, you see, he said, we all the time got hopes she would come back. In point of fact, he had purposefully delayed breaking the news to Bells in order that the settlement of Rednick's mortgage extension should not be prejudiced. But now, he added ingenuously, it don't make no difference because Rednick's telephones me yesterday morning that the whole thing is off on account of he is married. Married? Listen, Geld cried. Do you mean to tell me that old Shimiel gets married yet? So sure as you're sitting there, and he says he would come round here this morning and see you. He should save himself the trouble, Bells declared angrily. Now, particularly that Bloomer Duckman ain't up there at all. I wouldn't extend that mortgage, not if he gives the deed to that home to take effect right today yet. I shouldn't be gone with you in the first place, Schindelberger. Schindelberger seized his hat. I acted for the best, he said. I'm sorry you should get delayed on your mortgage, gentlemen. Uh, but you shouldn't hold it up against me. I done it for the sake of Bill Hirschkind home, which if people get sore at me on account of I always act charitable, that's their lookout, not mine. He started for the door as he finished speaking, but as he placed his hand on the knob, someone turned it from the other side, and the next moment he stood face to face with Rudnick. So, Schindelberger exclaimed, you are really coming up here, are you? It ain't a bluff like you are uh, taking my car to go up to the home and you never went near the place at all. Rudnick shut the door behind him. What do you mean I didn't go near the place at all, he said angrily. Do you think I'm such a liar like you are, Schindelberger? Not only did I go near the place, but I got so near that a hundred feet more and the engine would knock me into the front door of the home already. It was then that Lissengeld and Bells observed the stout cane on which Rudnick supported himself. I come pretty close to being killed already on account of I'm going up to the home, he continued. And if nobody is asking me to sit down, I would sit down anyway, because if a fellow gets run over by a train, he naturally don't feel so strong, even if he would escape with bruises only. Did you got run over with a train? Schindelberger asked. I certainly did, Rudnick said. I got run over with a train and married in six days, and if you go to work and foreclose my house on me today yet, it will sure make a busy week for me. He looked pathetically at Bells, unless, he added, you are going to give me a show and extend the mortgage. Bells met this appeal with stolid indifference. Of course, Rednick, he said. I'm sorry you got run over with a train, but if we would extend your mortgage on account you got run over with a train and our other mortgages hears of it, Understand me, the way money is so tight nowadays, every time a mortgage comes due, them suckers would ring in trolley or car accidents on us and fall down coal holes, so as we would give them an extension already. And wouldn't it make no difference that I just got married? Rudnick asked. If an old fellow like you gets married, Rudnick, Bells replied, he must got to take the consequences. An idea! Listen, Geld exclaimed. Do you think that we are making wedding presents to our mortgages yet, Rudnick? It serves you right, Rudnick, Schindelberger said. If you would consent to the home, get in your property, I wouldn't say nothing about Miss Duckman's disappearing and Bells would have extended the mortgage on you. I was willing to do it, Rudnick said. Alba, my wife wouldn't let me. She says rather than see the house go that way, she would let you gentlemen foreclose it on us, even if she would got to starve. I don't know who your wife is, Schindelberger rejoined angrily, but she talks like a big fool. No, she don't, Rudnick retorted. She talks like a sensible woman because, in the first place, she wouldn't got to starve. I got enough strength left that I could always make for her and me anyhow a living. And, in the second place, the home really ain't a home. It's a business. A business? Schindelberger cried. What do you mean, a business? I mean, a business, Rudnick replied. An underwear business. Them poor women up there makes underwear from morning till night already. And Schindelberger here gets a brother-in-law, which he buys it from the home for pretty near half as much as it would cost him to make it. Russia, Max Schindelberger shrieked. Who tells you such stories? My wife tells me, Rudnick replied. And how does your wife know it? Bells demanded. Because, Rudnick answered, she once used to live in the home. Then that only goes to show what a lie you are, Schindelberger said. Your wife couldn't have been in the home on account it only gets started last year, and everybody which went in there ain't never come out again. Everybody but one, Rignick said as he seized his cane, and raising himself from the chair, he hobbled to the door. Bloom a leben, he cried, throwing the door wide open, and in response, Mrs. Rignick, nay, Bluma Duckman, entered. New bells, 
she said. Ain't you going to congratulate me? Bells sat back in his chair and stared at his wife's cousin in unaffected astonishment, while Schindelberger noiselessly opened the door and slid out of the room unnoticed. And so you run away from the home and marry the schnorr? Bells said at length. Schnorr he ain't, she retorted, unless you would go to work and foreclose the house. It would serve you right if I did, Bells rejoined. Then you ain't going to, Mrs. Rudnick asked. What do you mean he ain't going to? Lesengeld interrupted. Ain't I got nothing to say here? Must I got to sacrifice myself for Bells' wife's relations? Koosh, Lesengeld, Bells exploded. You take too much on yourself. Do you think for one moment I'm going to foreclose that mortgage and have them two old people snoring their living expenses out of me for the rest of my days just to oblige you? The mortgage runs at 6%, and it's going to continue to do so. 6% ain't to be sneezed at, neither. And ain't he going to pay us no bonus nor nothing? Lesengeld asked in anguished tones. Bonus? Bells cried. What are you talking about, bonus? Do you mean to told me you would ask an old man, which he nearly gets killed by a train already, a bonus yet? Honestly, Lesengeld, I'm surprised at you. The way you talk sometimes, it ain't no wonder people calls us second mortgage shocks. But looky here, Bells, Lesengeld began. Snuff, Lesengeld, Bells interrupted. You're lucky I don't ask you you should make him a wedding present yet. I suppose, Bells, you gonna make him a wedding present too, ain't it? Lesengeld jeered. That's just what I'm gonna do, Bells said as he turned to the safe. He fumbled round the middle compartment and finally produced two yellow slips of paper. I'm going to give him these here composition notes of Schendelberger's, and with what Blumen knows about the way that Rocher is running the Bellish Hirschkahn home, she shouldn't got no difficulty making him pay up. He handed the notes to Rudnick. And now, he said, sit right down and tell us how it comes that you and Bluma gets married. For more than a quarter of an hour, Rudnick described the details of his meeting with Miss Bluma Duckman, together with his hopes and aspirations for the future, and when he concluded, Bells turned to his partner. Ain't it funny how things happens, he said. Honestly, Lissengeld, ain't that more interesting than most things you could see it on a moving pictures? Lissengeld nodded sulkily. It sure ought to be, he said, because to go on a moving pictures, you pay only ten cents. Abba, got so dunk, this here story cost me my half of a $350 bonus. However... I suppose I shouldn't begrudge at him. I seen the other evening a film by the name of The Return of Enoch Aarons, where an old fellow stands outside on the street and looks through a window, and he sees a happy married couple met children standing in front of fire. So I says to my wife, Mama, I says, if that old snoozer would only get married, I says, he went and got to stand outside windows looking at other people having a good time, I says, he would be enjoying it with his own wife and children, I says, and I think right away of Rudnick here. He placed his hand on Rudnick's shoulder as he spoke. But now Rudnick is married, he concluded. And even if he wouldn't gotten children, he's got a good wife anyhow, which stands in the sitter already. A good wife is more valuable as rubies. Rudnick seized the hand of his blushing bride. And, he added, rubies is pretty high nowadays. End of section 11. Recording.